This is the sermon for the third Sunday in Lent. This morning we are reading from the second chapter of John's Gospel, beginning with the 13th verse. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple courts, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and others sitting at tables exchanging money. So he made a whip out of cords and drove all of them from the temple courts, both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. To those who sold doves, he said, get these out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a market. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then responded to him, What sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all of this? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and I will raise it again in three days. They replied, It has taken 46 years to build this temple, and you are going to raise it in three days? The temple he had spoken of was his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said. Then they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. This particular passage, often referred to as the cleansing of the temple, is frequently cited by proponents of the concept of a violent, angry God. How many times have I heard people say, either from the pulpit or in study, or even directly in conversation, words to the effect of, see, you're wrong. Jesus wasn't non-violent at all. In fact, he is violent, just like God the Father tearing apart the temple like that. Then there are some who might modify this position to suggest that Jesus was, for the most part, nonviolent. But here, before the Passover, he encountered something so egregious that he just lost it, as the expression goes. Jesus somehow loses control and just can't help himself evidence, perhaps, of his human side. This morning, we're going to take a look at this passage, and I hope dispel a few misconceptions, and in the process, understand the meaning of this seemingly uncharacteristic action. Let's begin, if we might, with a theological elephant in the room. Jesus' supposedly violent outburst. While we may readily imagine this as a scene where a particularly pious man becomes outraged at the misuse of religious property and then angrily breaks up the ersatz market, we might imagine that. And certainly I would suggest that most artistic representations of the passage depict a very angry-looking Jesus chasing people and animals alike out of the temple courtyard with a whip while he tosses furniture around. But in thinking of the story in this fashion, we may be guilty of, however subtly, casting Jesus in our own image. Surely many of us have gotten to places of frustration or anger in life where we have, or at least where we've wanted to, act out physically, to punch a wall or to break something, or possibly lash out at those whose behavior we find reprehensible. And to be sure, Jesus does, in no uncertain terms, make it clear that he disapproves of what is transpiring in the courtyard. But interestingly enough, the text 
does not say that he became angry. I suppose he may have been, but we're not told that. And that may be an important clue. John's Gospel is filled with insights into Jesus' emotional states. We learn of places where his spirit is troubled, where he groans inwardly and aloud. But here, John gives us just the facts. It was before Passover. Jesus comes across these things. He fashions a whip out of cords with which to drive out the livestock, orders the sellers of doves to remove the cages, and then scatters the coins and overturns the tables. He could be angry, maybe. But I'd like to suggest something else. I would like to suggest that Jesus' actions, even if his emotional state was one of anger, were calm and deliberate. If that's the case, the reaction of those watching this scene, identified by John only as the Jews, makes more sense. R rather than attempt to bodily remove the one who is creating some sort of disturbance, they ask him, show us, show us by a sign, by whose authority you do this. Almost as if Jesus' actions seemed like some sort of official, but nonetheless mysterious policy they wanted to understand. Now, I've often heard it taught that Jesus was so outraged by what he saw because of the unfair exchange rate of the money changers. The Jews, of course, would not allow unclean Roman money into the temple, so they exchanged it for pure temple currency at a rate most unfavorable to those who were to make offerings. Furthermore, the livestock intended for sacrifice were sold at exorbitant rates. And both of these happenstances left the poor at a particular disadvantage. Now, that very well may have been the case. There's no direct textual evidence that supports such statements. We do have some historical reason to believe that unfair exchange rates and too high prices for the supposedly appropriate animal sacrifices very well may have been the case. But our text, again, does not say that. And if that were the reason why Jesus effectively, if only for the moment, shut down the markets, one would imagine the authors of John's Gospel would have told us so. Certainly the aforementioned reasons make sense to us. We like them. It gives the otherwise gentle Jesus a reason for becoming so outraged and physical. But what if we've got it wrong, or at least somewhat askew? First of all, what if what Jesus did wasn't cleanse the temple at all? Once again, the text does not say before Passover, Jesus went to cleanse the temple. Truth be told, for a moment, and just a moment, he didn't cleanse it. He shut it down. Perhaps his actions were not at all an evidence of God losing control or Jesus showing what we might call his human side but rather a well-orchestrated demonstration of what God really wanted. Just as Jesus' entire public ministry, his whole life on earth, in fact, was a demonstration, a picture, if you will, of what God the Father wants. Why have you made my Father's house a marketplace? The temple was more than a marketplace in a sense that coins were exchanged and animals were sold. In truth, from the understanding of the day, 
the entire business of atonement was transactional. Make this particular sacrifice, get forgiven for these particular sins for another year. See you next year when your atonement expires. Again and again, the transaction was played out. Listen, if you will, to this decidedly graphic description of the temple from a sermon by the Reverend Thomas Truby. The temple was a sacrificial shrine with blood sacrifice at its center, writes Truby. John says the Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. The Passover of the Jews was a major religious festival, and pilgrims from all over would be in long lines waiting their turn to have the priests slaughter their animals on the altar. Some didn't bring their own animals, and so merchants sold sheep, cattle, and doves to those who needed them. Because the temple was sacred Jewish space, anything Roman, and therefore non-Jewish and polluted, could not be allowed in. For this reason, Roman coins had to be exchanged for special temple currency. When the line began moving, the pace of the slaughter was rapid as hard-working priests dispatched and bled the animals as quickly as they could. It wasn't long before they stood knee-deep in blood, still finding its way through the elaborate temple drainage system that emptied into a nearby valley. Nobody thought anything of it except maybe the prophets who said that God desired mercy, not sacrifice. Most people considered the smell of blood in the air and the commotion of it all to be the price you pay to keep God happy and prevent bad things from happening to you and all Jewish people. In Driving out the animals, cattle and sheep alike, we're told. Jesus is making something clear, which the prophet Hosea understood hundreds of years earlier. I do not desire sacrifice, but mercy, we read in Hosea 6, 6. Something the psalmist also understood as he wrote, The acceptable sacrifices are pure and broken spirits. From Psalm 51. The first chapter of Malachi has God proclaiming, Oh, that one of you would shut the temple doors so that you would not light useless fires on my altar. Is it possible that in driving out the animals, Jesus is saying that the relationship between God and man is not transactional at all? As if to underscore that point, Jesus then does the thing that we can imagine was the most irritating of all to those who were there. He scatters the coins, overturns the money tables. Overturning the money tables, the money lands on the floor. Not only does that mean that someone has to pick it all up, but it means that at least symbolically, what is clean and unclean have been commingled, and Jesus makes it clear it belongs on the floor with the dust and the rubbish. Then and now, we make so much of money. It's almost treated as something sacred. We carefully tuck it away into special places, wallets and purses designed specifically for that purpose. We hide it Yet we carry it wherever we go. In polite society, we are loath to talk about it, like polite people not wanting to talk about their religion or politics. Yet we still find subtle ways to tell the world, well, I do have some money. Just as we subtly tell the world, yes, I have religion, by the expensive gold crosses we wear as jewelry. A funny thing, isn't it, to take an object of torture and execution and turn it into a fashion statement? What would Jesus do with that anyway? The temple money 
and the Roman money with Caesar's image on it mixed together on the floor with the dirt and the... Well, remember, this was a moment ago, a place where animals were being kept out in the open. Not a pretty sight, but a deeply graphic illustration. For a people whose religious practice was full of rich symbolism, I'm pretty sure they got it. At least, they got a glimpse. So perhaps it was in stunned awe, rather than angry retaliation, that they asked, By what authority do you do this? As they stared at their precious coinage on the filthy floor. Destroy this temple, Jesus says, speaking of himself, his own body, and I will build it up in three days. And that part they didn't get. Not yet, anyway. It's taken decades to build this temple. How are you going to destroy it and build it up again in three days? But we know what Jesus was talking about. The authors of John don't leave that part open to anyone's interpretation. They make it clear. Jesus was speaking of his own body. So what then does all of this mean? Jesus, I believe, did not want to cleanse the temple. He wanted to end it. And ultimately, he did. If we view the story of the Hebrew people as the story of mankind's growing understanding of God, as well as of itself, if we see the way in which they moved in Genesis 22, which we looked at last week, from human sacrifice to animal sacrifice, certainly an improvement, to ultimately the recognition that God, who is spirit, has no need of the death of animals at all, finally to the place where Jesus teaches us that it's not about transaction. It's not about giving one life for another. In short, the sacrifice of animals replaced what was, before the time of Abraham, the sacrifice of other humans. And Jesus replaces the slaughterhouse temple with himself. And you will kill me, Jesus is telling them. You will destroy this temple, the temple of my body, just as every human body is a temple for God's Holy Spirit. You'll destroy this one, thinking, like Caiaphas the high priest, that you're making a kind of sacrifice, a sacrifice of one man to die for everyone, a human scapegoat. And I will prove you wrong. I'll prove to you that God doesn't need death, doesn't love death, doesn't want death, not mine, not yours, not anyone's. For in three days, I will make a mockery of death. I will show you that death has no meaning at all. Here, then, is a new way to worship, the new way to come before God, not with acts of slaughter, no more slaughtering animals, especially no more slaughtering people, no more slaughtering of whole nations and cultures. The way to come before God is in spirit and in truth, with acts of love and mercy, with deeds that proclaim forgiveness and reconciliation. So now my question for all of us. What marketplace is in your temple, the temple that God has given you as a dwelling for your spirit and for God's spirit? What place of transaction, of slaughter, of violence are you harboring within your spiritual gates. Allow the one who is without violence to turn over those tables, not angrily, but with firm resolution. Let him drive out what does not belong, again, 
not with violence, but with loving determination. The God of the markets, the temple of the markets, they are passing away to be supplanted by the God of love, peace, and righteousness, the giver of all light and life.